All right, everybody. Hey, first, let's give a round of applause for everybody that puts on B-sides. Come on. Hi, Rocky. Now, these are, uh, these are absolutely amazing events, and uh, having come since the B-Sides one, I think I've only missed one B-Sides. I think I was in China. Actually, I think I made that one. I had to go to China right afterwards, but uh, uh, I did make that. I did make made the flight. Um, but uh, it's great to see it in Cleveland here, uh, especially in our hometown, so awesome uh, turnout. I think we're, are we, are we uh, at capacity at the ground? Yep. Couldn't, couldn't fit any more in. That's great. So it's awesome to see. So uh, appreciate everybody coming to my talk. Uh, today's really talking about uh, uh, defeating a lot of the next-gen uh, technology you see out there, and what I like doing is kind of showing both sides, um, both the offensive side of, of what we're seeing today and, and getting around certain types of, of techniques, as well as where the industry needs to move um, on the detection side as well um, and where, how we can get better. So hopefully you can apply both concepts here uh, for this talk. Um, just a brief introduction myself. I'm Dave Kennedy. I started uh, Trusted Sec, uh, as well as Binary Defense, uh, local companies here in Cleveland, uh, one in Hudson and one in Strongsville. Uh, so uh, different locations, uh, but we have folks all over the country. Um, and it's been great. Uh, author of the Social Engineer Toolkit and some other stuff. Um, been helping on the Mr. Robot TV show, which has been really neat. Uh, wait till season three. It's going to be really cool. Something, a big surprise in there. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a little bit about me. So good news is I don't really have to give a talk anymore. Um, I'm just going to leave it there and we can all go home now. So it's been fun. So in all seriousness, uh, you know, this is what we're seeing today as far as the, the marketing campaigns go. Uh, you know, goodbye data breaches, um, you know, artificial intelligence that's designed to stop all the hackers, uh, you know, stuff that's, that's considered next generation. And uh, a lot of the tout is, you know, hey, next generation is there so that you can remove a lot of the controls, the traditional stuff that you've had uh, in place before, um, so that you can replace a lot of the things, uh, the, the bulkiness of things. Like, uh, anybody see the latest, uh, I think it's SEP14? You know, anybody know how, how uh, large the installer is? SEP14 is one gig. One gig. You're putting one gig of shit on, uh, part of the, I think there's, is there kids here? Sorry. <laughs> Any kids? All right. One, okay. You're putting one gig of shit on your computer. And, and it's, it's insane, right? Whereas you have a lot of these next generation ones that tout a lot less, right? You know, less CPU, less RAM, uh, you know, less, you know, data usage, everything else. And it's not a one gig installer, right? Um, what's interesting enough about a lot of these um, touts is we'll see whether or not they kind of hold up. We'll talk a little about that. And so if you look at... Um, what we do as attackers, the, the big focus now is either on the prevention side, so hopefully we have good prevention controls in place, right, to stop the hackers, uh, you know, good, good ingress, uh, firewall rules, um, good egress, and hopefully, you know, in the event that a user clicks on something, uh, we have good preventative controls to stop that. But we also recognize as an industry that, you know, uh, when it comes to detection as well, that also has to be just as much on par, if not better, um, than our prevention cycle. So, you know, in the event that we get a compromise, can we actually detect that and respond and mitigate uh, the risk that happens out there? And as attackers, our goal is to circumvent the, the, those, uh, that detection criteria, right? Um, so to do things like lateral movement uh, and get undetected, to you know, escalate permissions and move to different systems, to get access to the data that we want access to. And so I'd say as a whole, the industry itself has gotten uh, a little bit better. You know, I would say, you know, if, you, if you looked at one of my talks probably three or four years ago, um, I would have said that the same techniques that I use today um, are the same techniques that I used 10 years ago. And I would say that I have, I've had to shift a lot of my tactics as an attacker. We, as, as, a, as an industry, had a, has had to shift a lot of our techniques as attackers so that we can skirt a lot of the, the traditional detection methods out there. Um, granted, still a lot of horrible companies out there, no offense. Uh, you know, a lot of companies where it's very still easy to, to break in on a lot of detection criteria. Um, but as an industry, we're progressing forward pretty heavily. And so if you look at a lot of the next generation products out there, they're taunting enhanced detection and protection capabilities. And so what's interesting about a lot of these is, you know, there, a lot of these are built on a lot of core concepts um, of what we talked about, like uh, known good or application whitelisting, maybe make it a little bit easier, um, or the artificial intelligence stuff, which, you know, if you look at a scalability perspective, uh, makes it a lot, lot more difficult. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a second. Um, but what's interesting about the next generation product lines is they may do something or one thing very well, but when it comes to the overall product itself, it usually falls pretty far and, and flat. We'll talk about um, how that works. And so if you look at most products, and let's just use Carbon Black as a good example. Um, I'm, I actually like Carbon Black as a product. I think uh, Bit9 from an application whitelisting perspective, and then the visibility you can get from an EDR side from a Carbon Black is great. Um, but what's interesting about Carbon Black is that you need to develop your watch list, right? Everybody familiar with watch list and Carbon Black and all that stuff, right? So if you don't have a team that's just sitting there researching all day long different attack patterns and building your watch list around the new attack patterns, um, you know, you're not having a good detect, you're not having good detection around uh, Carbon Black. 
In addition, uh, most of the watch lists that are, are created are very simplistic in nature. You might look for things like encoded command, right? Where there's 12 different variations of encoded command. There's dash E, there's dash EC, there's dash EN, there's ENCO. You know, you keep going on and on and on. There's a number of different variations around encoded command or just invoke expression. There's a lot of things you can do to not even uh, trigger um, uh, PowerShell commands that, that are, are traditional ones. And I'll talk uh, some, on, on some stuff on Unicorn on that one. But what's interesting is most products are very much still signature based. If this happens, then trigger an alarm. And so we're still in a mindset today of, hey, our patterns have to match what the attackers are doing. And I see a lot of companies that focus on lateral movement. A good example on lateral movement is, you know, uh, they'll build de detection criteria around WMI lateral movement, right? They'll, they'll look at PowerShell remoting, look at RPC and SMB as lateral movement. But they don't look at the, what the pattern of that is, right? Instead of looking at WMI or um, RPC or SMB, why not look for successful logins across your network from the same source IP address and look more on the behavior itself? And so as an industry, we have to focus more on the behavior patterns in, in addition, but as attackers, we have to emulate that behavior as well. And so you look at a lot of technology taught uh, as artificial intelligence and machine learning. The great part about this, and the reason why that this doesn't scare me yet as far as the technology as an attacker, is because humans are crazy, right? Humans do different things all the time that is beyond reasonable expectations of what human beings can do. And it's fantastic. You know, we have folks that are in HR, folks that are in sales, folks that are in IT, folks that are, you know, in R&D, and they all have different ways and patterns of behavior that they leverage on a different day-to-day -day basis. And that's why artificial intelligence from a um, uh, understanding around how humans behave and abnormal patterns of behavior, and that's so difficult to actually go and do. I, I think maybe five or 10 years down the road, um, AI will be a valuable resource in the security industry, but there's not a damn product out there in the market today that has stopped me once. Not one, not even close, not even a little bit, not even a little tiny bit, right? And so you look at this technology as touted as stopping attackers, and most of it is still so rudimentary uh, when it comes to how it actually goes and does detection uh, that getting around it's super trivial, and we'll talk a little about that. So when it comes to protection, um, <laughs> it's my favorite slide. <laughs> I'm getting at that age now, or my, my kids are getting at that age now. I'm like, man, is it time yet? You know, they're like, I have a son that's nine. I'm like, is that too soon? Or is it, you know, I don't know. What's the, what's the real age? Anybody, anybody got a good age? 12. 12? All right, all right, 12. 13? 17? 18? No? Okay. 21? <laughs> that's about my, 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 my daughter's locked in the basement until 21, so. <laughs> um, yeah. So when it comes to, when it comes to uh, protection um, and, and talking about protection, you know, there's, there's different variations of protection. We have what we call known good or application whitelisting. We have, you know, uh, detection when it comes to traditional antivirus detection. We have machine learning, artificial intelligence, a few other ones, uh, uh, to name a few. Um, and so when it comes to protection, in a lot of cases, like looking at something like Silence, most companies don't just actually stop you from stopping the service. Um, you can stop the service and you no longer um, are, are detected. Or just inject into a, its own process and you can do whatever you want to without being detected. Or just rename PowerShell.exe and then you can do anything you want to on that system uh, without any detection, which is fantastic. Or just use a custom packer. There's a number of different ways to get around a number of these different technologies. Um, but what's interesting is that you know, some of the detections may be cool in nature, like, hey, um, you know, maybe it detects like RegSVR32 going over. But it doesn't like, find basic stupid stuff like you know, macro injection with you know, viruses that literally are from like the sub-7 days in AOL. You know? And so you know, there's a big variation of what we see and a lot of these next generation products from what they actually detect or what they actually prevent against to what's actually real um, in the industry. And so when we go against a lot of these, um, you know, a lot of the basic stuff um, doesn't get picked up and they're looking for a lot of the more advanced APT type things that are out there um, in a lot of cases. But uh, you know, what's interesting about this one is this one's actually super easy um, to identify. Uh, PowerShell.exe, um, when you're calling PowerShell in any way, it loads two uh, DLLs, uh, well three technically, reflection.dll, uh, System.management.automation.dll and then System.management.ni.dll. And if you see those being called by a non-PowerShell.exe or non-PowerShell.underscore.ise.exe um, uh, application, then it's probably a good indication that you know someone's using something like Ben. Where's Ben at? Ben in here? Not in here? Ben? Yeah, there he is. Using something like no PowerShell that Ben wrote, um, you know, or or using something that leverages PowerShell that reflects into the DLLs itself to actually call and leverage PowerShell that goes around detection. Um, so a lot of these tools, again, very, don't do a lot of very basic stuff when it comes to, to actual detection. And so if you look at us for attackers, um, there's little to real no prevention for targeted attacks. Some of the basic stuff, the mass commoditized things, um, you know, like ransomware and stuff like that, um, a lot of these next generation products focus very heavily on those pieces, but don't look on a lot of the other cases around you know, uh, direct attackers or anything like that. Um, and so 
I'll show a quick demo on Unicorn. And I just did an update to Unicorn recently. I think uh, as of Thursday, I did a new release. Um, and I don't know if I pushed it up yet. I think I pushed it up. I don't remember. I don't know. I was riding on the airplane, so I forgot. Um, but uh, I have a new ver version of Unicorn. But uh, it incorporates a lot of new techniques uh, for getting around a lot of the different PowerShell um, attack vectors. Now, what's interesting is um, most of these tools, when it talks about PowerShell detection, will look for certain patterns, right? Um, they'll look for encoded command, invoke expression. They'll look for you know, kernel 32.dll being called. They'll look for memory injection uh, techniques that are being leveraged in there. Um, so they're still very much signature based. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, if I completely obfuscate, I'm not calling any of those, will you detect me? Probably not, right? But if you were uh, 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 on the blue team side and you're looking more for, hey, what's the length of the PowerShell command? Or why is PowerShell.exe beaconing out to the internet? Would you detect me in that case? Probably, right? And so those are things that we need to look at um, much differently. So let me show you an example of, of Unicorn here. So this is the latest version. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that. I'll blow it up here in just a second if I can type. So um, with Unicorn, there's you know any, any type of tool, you can't have a, a hacker tool without ASCII art. Um, that's number first and foremost, right? Um, but what we're going to do is, is um, just show you a couple of the things here. And you can use any payload you want to now. Um, but by default, it can, you can use uh, Metasploit. Let's enter my IP address. Now, when it comes to this specific technique, uh, we actually had a customer doing a, a purple team exercise, and they had some really good um, detection criteria around encoded command. And so what we decided to do is, is you know, uh, leverage encoded command without ever calling encoded command itself um, to get around their watch lists. And so in this case, if you look at the code, am I ever calling a code of command? Totally looks legit, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure it's legit. Um, so what other ones will do is they'll automatically try to reassemble uh, the base64 uh, encoded string so you can see the decoded version. And so what we do is we actually chunk those up since they're not actually doing a Python or a PowerShell interpreter. So you look here, we actually chunk them up so that they're not really base64. Just stupid stuff like that gets around most of them, um, all of them, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so you can see here, it's actually going to be executing, um, and you, you can't actually see it, but it will execute a uh, uh, shell called directly in memory. And this is just a, you copy and paste this into anywhere you have remote command execution, um, whether it's you know, PS exec or other methods that you're leveraging to compromise the machine. And this will give you a shell that directly um, injects shell code directly into memory, um, and then allows you to not touch disk in a lot of cases. So um, easy way of doing that, and it gets around um, antivirus. Now, we're just using string variables um, and then two string to convert it back to an actual string for us. So this is basically assembling um, dash E and C without ever calling dash ENC ever. So you're not going to see it. Echo, echo. Sounds better. You messing with me, Jason? Is it you? Yeah. All right. So that's a good one. Um, there we go. So that's a good one. Um, now, what's, what's great about that one specifically um, is it, it works well. But if you ever decide to look at my code, I always put other ones in there that I don't necessarily publish. And so there's another good one here using chars to convert encoded command as well. So there's a number of different ways um, to go and do it. Now, if I happen to be, uh, don't look at all this stuff here, like, uh, <laughs> I was having a bad night. I wrote a, sh a, a crappy signature, so I, just, I think I was drinking too. I think. <laughs> As, uh, yeah, programs in Emergate has nothing to do with security, but if someone becomes popular, let's write a signature, annoy the author. Uh, yeah, yeah, anyways. So, anyways, a long time. I think I called out Kaspersky to you in here. Yeah. I went on a pretty long rant here. Wow, I, gotta, I remember this long. Huh, still going. Oh, yeah, little dying breed, okay. Yeah, sorry for the rant. Uh read stupid stuff because you wrote shitty sig, okay. All right, all right, yeah. Whoopsie. Anyways, um, yeah. So, you know, um, real stupid stuff to get around most of these uh, uh, technologies in a lot of cases. Now, um, one of the big ones is obviously macro injection, right? And, and it's funny because macros um, still being leveraged to this day are absolutely crazy, right? Because we still need to leverage as business processes. Now, I'd say a lot of the technology is starting to get better um, at detecting what malicious um, macros look like. Uh, but what's interesting about that for like malicious macros is a good example, um, is they'll look for certain things inside the macros themselves. Like, are they calling PowerShell? So. 
Let me just generate use unicorn again. We'll generate a macro. And so to get around them looking for PowerShell inside of it, we just type out PowerShell and do ands. <laughs> That's literally what we have to do as attackers. Like, hey, just don't call PowerShell directly and just do ands. It's cool, right? And then um, they were uh, flagging out some of my, my variable names, so I had to randomize my variable names. OK, that was hard. Um, it's actually, I'll tell you, it gets confusing when you're writing your own um, like, like variable generator because you're like, what the hell does that and that add up to to equal that and then this? And then you're like, I don't know what I just did up here, and I forgot everything, so i got to do it all over again. So writing your own encoder really sucks. Um, it's not hard. It's just a pain in the ass. Um, but here we don't actually call encoder command either. Uh, and then this is all of our stuff. What's nice about this one um, is when they go to open it, uh, what will happen is it will say, this, this document is corrupt. Um, you know, it says, uh, you know, the document appears to be made of an older version of Microsoft. I should, I should say um, when, uh, Microsoft Office. I'll change that. Uh, please have the creator um, save to a new and uh, supported format. And then it closes the, the Office document out like nothing happened. And then they still compromise the machine, which is fantastic, right? Um, so it looks legitimate in every way. Uh, it's something that you would want to go and actually open. So that's another good one. Another um, hotness as well, and this, this is uh, really old school, is HTAs. Um, and HTAs are still um, used. And if you're a defender, um, just by blocking HTAs doesn't make a difference. You can actually um, change the extension type on an HTA and do a MIME type of HTA and still download and execute that way. Um, so what you to actually do is, is on your web content filtering, block MIME type of HTAs um, to actually stop those. But if you're not familiar, HTAs are like what's being used right now by all the drive-by, Chrome update, um, you know, malware and stuff like that. What's great about it is it doesn't need to touch disk either. Um, you can call PowerShell commands uh, directly from it. I think it's under... I wrote the code, I don't remember. Here it is. Um, so here's an HTA example. Looks totally good, I'm sure. Um, if you were to see, now again, as a, as a defender, you know, I might chunk this up. You, know, I might, you might not get this from your detection st standpoint, but this should look malicious, right, if you're actually getting the length of an actual file, right? This is probably not legit. And again, we do stupid stuff like, hey, they're flagging on command.exe. Okay, let's chunk up command.exe. Um, you know, hey, they're looking for WScript. Okay, let's check, check up WScript.shell. Fine, no problem. And it gets around no problem. Uh, what, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Easy stuff. Easy stuff. And I'll show you a demo using that all together here in just a second. And so um, the, the whole AI and machine learning thing, as long as we have users on that, and that, that's the biggest thing that I've seen. Um, you know, you see a lot of these, these tools, and they may be very good um, for a very small organization, but as it starts to expand, um, the false positive ratios um, are, are uh, substantial on these tools. Um, and and that's, that's, a, that's a business killer, right? Um, and so you have different variations of, of protection. You have stuff that has a very high false positive ratio, and so basically it just goes into detect mode, and that's all you get out of it. Um, and and that, that's fine if, you, if that's good for you. Then you have the other polar opposites, and, and uh, a good example of this is, is Office 365. Um, Office 365 is the exact opposite. Now think about their uh, Microsoft as an organization. They're one of the largest companies in the world, right? Now, from a technology perspective, and they have to cater to every, you know, uh, 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 geographic location. You know, millions and millions and millions of users. They have to be up all the time, uh, and their uh, protection features can't block normal operations of business, right? So think about that that scenario right there. Are they going to have a good protection product? No. Right? And, and a good example of that is a, a long story. So a few weeks ago, or it was a, uh, about a month and a half ago, um, I, you know, I was on Twitter, uh, which is unusual for me, right? Uh, um, I think I was just getting a huge debate on CISP yesterday. So anyways, burned the internet down that day. Um, but uh, what was interesting about um, uh, this one was uh, there was a guy named Jose that's uh, part of CNN. And uh, Jose was talking about how he gets all these, these annoying spam emails and he always hits the unsubscribe, and that if you hit the unsubscribe, you know, that'd be a great place to deploy malware. And I didn't even see that tweet, but someone responded back and was like, oh, hey, Dave Kennedy uses that all the time, you know, in, in his fishes. Um, you should talk to him or whatever, because it, it works really well. And that's what I do. Like, I'll, I'll annoy the shit out of somebody. I'll send them like seven or eight emails. And, and, and the, the link that they go to is just some bullshit survey that does no malicious code, but as soon as you hit unsubscribe, it compromises their computer. And even if they fail the survey, I keep hitting them with it, right? Until they hit unsubscribe. <laughs> Totally pisses them off. And I randomize the email too, so it comes from different email addresses. So even if they like move it into the rules, it fucks them up each time. So it's so good. <laughs> love it. Love it. Human beings, love you. Um, and so with that one specifically, um, you, know, uh, you know, he's talking about it and, uh, and someone responded back and, and uh, 
Someone from Microsoft responded back, and, and this is, you know, uh, and, and it's not a knock on Microsoft in any way. A lot of brilliant folks over there, and I respect the heck out of them. I mean, a lot of my, my uh, people that I, I consider like top, top folks in the industry out there. Um, but one, someone responded from like the, the sales side of the house and said, well, you know, um, Microsoft's advanced threat protection would have prevented this from happening. And it was funny, it, like, like there's certain moments in life where like God shines a light on you. And I just gotten off of a Microsoft Advanced Threat Protection review. Like I, I went in and out of the whole thing, right? I knew everything about this, this product, right? And I responded back and I'm like, well, you know, my experience is, I was trying to be nice, you know, like my experience is uh, I would not have, have protected against this one specific. There's a lot of great features with it though, right? You know, just trying to be nice, right? And the person responds back, and this is on a Friday, by the way, and I, I, let me just paint a picture, okay? I have friends coming over for dinner. I have the whole weekend planned out. You know, everything's going to be great. I have a, a re weekend off of not having to work or anything like that. And this guy responds back, and he's like, oh, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to rep your shit product. <laughs> so then I put my Batman cape on, right? And someone wronged me on the internet. Uh, and and so, so I'm in front of my computer. I'm like, you know, and... And uh, one of our guys, Dave's coming over with his wife, and uh, and, and I, I skipped dinner. They're they're watching me. They're taking pictures of me inside. Me, I have my hoodie on, you know, my, my my keyboard's on fire. Um, and so my whole purpose of this was was to to obviously uh, uh, prove that and discredit that in, in every way, shape, or form. And so um, what I did is I ended up releasing a lot of analysis around Microsoft's advanced advanced threat protection. And what was interesting is with it is um, advanced threat protection is broken into two different components. Okay, you have what's called safe links and safe attachments. Safe links is uh, uh, you know for web content. So if you get an email, uh, what it does, and, and, and I'm going to ask a question here in a second if you think this is a good idea or not. Um, what happens when you get an email from Safe Links um, is it rewrites the URL um, to a safelinks.microsoft.com with a random GUID at the end of it, right? So let me ask a question. When, when, so a user, when they hover over it, it just says Microsoft Safe Links, and they can't even tell what the original URL was. Okay. So is that is that a good idea first and foremost? No. What does that do? I mean, granted, the whole hover thing probably doesn't work anyway for our users. But we say it does. So right. They, so the whole hover over thing we lose now. We teach all of our users to hover over the links. Now they can no longer do that, right? So that's one ding, right? But but hey, if their 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 protection is superior out there, right? Then it should be fine, right? Now, do we trust, so, so basically we're implicitly trusting Microsoft, right? Now, do we implicitly trust Microsoft? No, no right? Okay, we're good. We're on the same page. It's fantastic. Okay. So I decided to take a look. And so you know, in order for me to, to move to a cloud service, right, there would have to be a couple criteria um, things that would have to be met. Uh, first and foremost, I would have to have the same or greater protections or the same detection or greater detection. Okay, that'd be my criteria for moving into something like that, right? So safe links, you know, you hover over the link, it says safe links, you click on it. What would be good protection, uh, equal or greater protection to me would be something that actually does dynamic content inspection um, of the website itself, right? Like, um, like memory corruption flaws, exploit code, viruses, like shitty viruses that everybody catches, or like anything, right? Like anything at all, right? It would be a, a criteria for that, right? So what I found with safe links is it doesn't do any dynamic inspection at all of the website or anything that you're downloading from the website at all. So, so you can download like an old school AOL virus that gets picked up by every single uh, you know antivirus out there, or just use like a Metasploit you know uh, un unpacked you know un unobfuscated exe that everybody picks up because they think it's cool to detect Metasploit uh, and put that up in there as well, and you're fine, no problem, zero. What it does is they actually have a blacklist and whitelist for things that they've actually seen before in the past, and they blacklist those IP addresses. So that's one piece, okay. So, and by the way, if you get blacklisted, you can just submit it to Microsoft and they, they remove you from that blacklist and give you a higher reputation in about three hours. So, uh, <laughs> works well, it's fantastic. Um, the second piece was uh, safe attachments, which is supposed to be a competitor to like Wildfire, um, you know, or, or uh, uh, FireEye, or a lot of those other ones, right, to do a sandbox and virtualization. Um, what was interesting about that one is, <laughs> um, first and foremost, when you get an email with an attachment, it will, it, whether it's a document or zip or whatever, it takes 15 minutes to get that document or that attachment. I repeat, when you get an email and there's an attachment onto it, you have to wait 15 minutes. Your whole business has to wait 15 minutes to get that attachment, right? Is, so does that work? No. no, right? Hey, CEO, uh, security, right? We're going to be the over draconian folks that, uh, you know, it's going to get to give a blood sample, urine sample, and 15 minutes to get your attachment as well, too. So, um, so that was an interesting one. I think they're fixing that, which is a good thing. Uh, but what was interesting about the uh, uh, safe attachments piece of it um, is that it does some basic uh, macro identification, but very basic. Um, and it does basically Windows Defender. Um, and so 
from a virtualization and sandboxing technology wasn't very good. So again, I wouldn't recommend that as a, as a big deal. But two polar opposite environments, right? One, you have you know, millions of users. And over here, you have something that doesn't scale to large organizations. And so there's no middle ground when it comes to what we're dealing with on next generation product lines all the way over to you know, what is the, the commoditized stuff. I mean, we either have Symantec, McAfee, or other ones that, pardon the language, but is, is shit from a, from a detection standpoint, but at least it does like stuff on basic stuff, right? Or the stuff over here that doesn't scale, and if we don't have a team to manage like 7,000 know, million alarms, then we're, we're effed, right? Or to build all the content out to reduce the false positives. So it's one opposite or the other is what we have today in the industry, okay? And so the signals noise ratio becomes important when it comes to detection because if we can't take this data and look at it, which is a, a term called hunt teaming, right? Everybody familiar with the term hunt teaming, right? Going on the hunt looking for things. If we can't you know, take a lot of that noise away, we don't have the ability to actually go down and look at that. And so how do we uh, attack without getting detected is the biggest part about it, right? I love this one, right? Um, so cool. I wish I would have had a picture of that, like my, my cat actually did it. Um, first and foremost, um, going after your targets is, is important, okay? Uh, and understanding what your targets are. I'm going to assume that they have good technology. We're going to build our attack profiles um, very much off of, off of the, the, the um, targets that we're going after. And then from there, we'll prepare for what they might have. And let's just say, we, we, you know, I'm, I'm sure no one bleeds any information over LinkedIn about the technologies that you have in your environment, you know, whether you're a Microsoft shop or you're an ArcSight shop or you're a Symantec shop. That's not in our, our bios when it, when it comes to um, who we are or what we work with. Um, and then from there, we'll do and, and register things like uh, a couple good examples is uh, Cat My Fish and Domain Hunter. If you're not familiar with them, what will happen a lot in a lot of times um, is domains will expire and they're already categorized by web content filtering. And so what you can do is you can just use these two tools and you just look for which ones are categorized already and go and buy them for you know 15 bucks or 10 bucks. And now you already have a high reputation site that you don't have to worry about from when you're fishing from. And there's great ones like survey sites. And, and what's great, um, a lot of times what we'll do is let's just say we're targeting a company that's mostly business to business we'll actually buy a domain name um, of a business that they would want to sell to from a business to business perspective, register that domain, clone it, and now we have a direct avenue to the sales folks, right? Hey, I have a million dollars I need to spend by Friday. Can you open up this virus.exe so that I can get you my PO? Sure, no problem, cool. Um, so you can literally do whatever you want to, especially if you're guaranteeing money on the back end of it, right? And so from the social engineering side, um, I love obviously set uh, from, a, from a social engineering perspective, but tying all these in, I have a very unique voice. Sorry, I fluctuate and I get excited. I apologize. So uh, from the social engineer toolkit side, um, leveraging things like the HTA attack book, there's just a number of ones, right? You can use Java applets like you saw with Strand doing earlier, uh, who did a wonderful job on that. And you can use uh, uh, you know, attached documents, uh, direct data types, um, you know, macro injection, uh, whatever you want to, um, to try to get them to click on things. Um, HTA still work very well um, in a lot of cases for most companies. And so let's go ahead and do uh, one for social engineering. We'll do two the website, and we'll do eight the HDA attack vector. And I'll do a site clone, and I'll just clone TrustedSec as an example. And then I need my IP address, which I forgot to get before I started. And I'll just use my interpreter. And so once it does everything, it's going to clone the site. Um, use the PowerShell injection technique, and this is the new obfuscated one, by the way, so it doesn't actually call encoded command or anything like that anymore. It's going to use the, the uh, unique string uh, every time it generates an all randomized uh, variable names and everything else, uh, not actually call PowerShell, a lot of the other ones as well. And I also implement this in every one that uses the PowerShell attack, so like the MS SQL Brooder, um, a lot of the other ones on the fast track side for exploitation, the PowerShell injection techniques, it all uses the new encoded uh, PowerShell method. So let's go to open up Internet Explorer. Uh, and so we go to our site, and again, we register a domain name that looks similar, but they get this prompt. I'm sure no one would ever click open, ever. But that's the prompt that you basically get, right? That's what it looks like when you go into an Internet Explorer site. Now, when it's done, it'll redirect back to the legitimate site here in just a second. I have a little bit of a slow internet connection, so it'll take a second. But it'll redirect back, and then we have access, and this is a Windows 10 with uh, Windows Defender fully updated, everything else, right? Um, you know, down here we get our shell. Good. And uh, interesting enough, I don't know of anything that actually picks up the new version of Unicorn, especially if you're using the char encoding. 
Uh, the char encoding is fantastic. So, um, you know, if you're a defender, looking on the link size is, is super important. And so, um, the, the PowerShell is just one method. Now, PowerShell is becoming um, a very much saturated market, right? Because a lot of folks are, are, are leveraging PowerShell as their attack vector. You have PowerShell Empire, you have PowerSploit, you have, you know, a lot of research is happening from the Russian hackers that use the elite, you know, uh, uh, persistence methods and stuff like that. Um, so there's a lot of other techniques you can leverage for getting remote code execution um, on machines. There's a number of them. And if you're not familiar with a guy named Subte, I uh, highly, highly recommend following him on Twitter, S-U-B-T-E-E. -E. He's like the, the one that's coming up with all these different um, app bypasses. And, and what's happening is, let's just say a company does application whitelisting very well. Um, there's still ways and techniques of getting around application whitelisting. Um, but even if they're not using application whitelisting, this is universally things that you can leverage um, in your environment to get remote code execution. Things like RegSVR32. Um, RegSVR32 is a, a, um, one of the most notorious ones because it has a built-in uh, browser that's proxyware inside of the executable. And you can download what are called SCT files um, to, to get remote code execution directly into memory. And it doesn't need to be a .SCT extension. So if you're just blocking on .SCTs, that's not a good indication. Um, SubT also came out with something recently where the format of the file, if you're looking for an indicator, uh, has changed. You can use different types uh, to get remote code execution as well. So if you're looking at the content of the files, um, those also shift too. Um, so you know the, the best way to identify this one would be, hey, why is RegSVR32 beaconing out to the internet? Um, that's probably a good indication. There's some other good things you can do with like Device Guard. Uh, Device Guard actually has uh, some awesome policies of locking the systems down to not leveraging a lot of these executables that you can do out there. And so that's what the SCT file looks like, but that can change um, as much as you want to. This is just an idea of spawning shell, but uh, or calc. Uh, if you're the NSA, Minesweeper is the, the one that, that they leverage, uh, if you're cool. Uh, they're too cool for calc, apparently, or notepad. Uh, this one's always one of my favorites. Um, using fileless persistence, um, that's what I've started switching to. Is, is, is leveraging less um, methods for um, actually dropping files to disk for persistence, but using other methods to get persistence that don't actually reside on disk itself. Um, and you can uh, run into a number of different uh, locations, you know, standard run uh, areas. Most people aren't looking for all of the persistence hooks and environments, but Auto Runs has a, a number of those. Um, but this one is my favorite. So this is, uh, um, so remember when we did the HTA file, right? Well, HTA files actually call an executable called MS, uh, uh, um, MSHTA, and um, in the about parameters, that's vulnerable to uh, uh, being able to call script tags directly from the command line. Um, and you can execute commands directly from the command line, including underlying PowerShell command, uh, commands. And so what we can do here is we can actually spray our PowerShell command through multiple registry entries, like five or six, and then eval them back to an actual statement, and then execute our PowerShell command upon each boot without getting detected. Um, so, uh, so I wrote a tool that does that. Uh, I'll probably publish it soon. Uh, we use it internally. Um, but basically, when you go to leverage it, it's just a PowerShell command that leverages that rips into multiple registry keys, um, all you know, obfuscated each time, randomized uh, keys in different locations, and then uh, and then whenever they reboot, it just does an eval onto that statement itself, and then actually executes that PowerShell command uh, to get you persistence and having a backdoor on the system itself. So, and what's great about that is it's not limited to length size as well. Um, so very difficult to actually go and detect against. Uh, when it comes out of them. There's a number of these too, by the way. So like RegSVR32 is a good example of persistence hooks. But most people aren't looking for MSHTA being called on the underlying operating system with the about commands. Um, there's a number of, of, of these, by the way, that are, are vulnerable, not just the about, um, about uh, properties as well. So if there's some good ones out there that I haven't published. Um, so what's great about that is you have the ability to use MSHTA to execute code, um, PowerShell, whatever you want to. Um, and you can control uh, uh, high content formats um, and execute whatever you want to under the context of that user account that you've compromised, which is fantastic. Uh, if you're not familiar with image file executions, uh, this is also another great place for persistence. Uh, a long time ago, uh, what you used to have to do uh, for persistence methods uh, are for like uh, the sticky keys. Everybody remember the sticky keys piece? Well, you used to have to reboot the machine, right? And then you'd have to like mount the drive, and then from there you'd have to go to SQL and backslash Windows, backslash System32, backslash setht.exe, or utilman.exe, or a few, the, uh, a few of the other ones. And then what you do is you'd rename that to your back door, right? And then when your computer popped up, you can hit the shift key like five times and it'd pop up a command prompt, right? Now, funny story, we find these on pen tests all the time. Like, like I would heavily recommend sweeping your network looking for sticky keys because there's a good chance that, that some admin got locked out at one point in time and used sticky keys and never put it back. Um, find it all the time. In fact, there's a customer of ours that actually wrote a script to go out because they kept finding them so often uh, in their environment that they had to actually write a script to actually go and test for these. Uh, talk about bad process control there, but regardless, Whatever. Um, this one was nice because you don't actually have to uh, 
um, reboot the machine. Um, and you can, you can replace any executable file, protected executable file, on the Windows operating system with whatever command, uh, with, with whatever um, uh, executable you want to. And so you can use image file execution uh, to take sethd.exe and put it in debug mode into whatever um, application you want to without having to worry about uh, rebooting it. So it replaces that application, and then you have a persistent backdoor um, on the file system itself, which is nice. Some other awesome app bypasses for remote code execution, uh, tracker.exe, run DLL32. Run DLL32 has been around forever. Um, you know, if you're seeing a DLL being imported in memory and then calling out to the internet, that's probably a good indicator that something's wrong. Although HP and Lexmark apparently leverage that for some reason. Like, so for some reason, printer drivers need to beacon out to the internet and get imported through Run DLL32. No idea. Um, but probably want to take a look at that. And you see msbuild.exe beaking out to the internet, another good indication that you're probably compromised or owned. Uh, RegSVR32, CBD. Uh, and there's so many more. Uh, Math Matthew Graber actually has a, uh, so Sub-T is the, the guy you want to follow for that. Uh, but Matthew Graber, uh, at Manifestation on Twitter, um, he's got a, uh, if you look at his uh, GitHub repo, he's got a great uh, device guard uh, uh, policy uh, that you can leverage that actually has all of these executables that you actually want to monitor for uh, in your environment that lists them all out. So those are some attack techniques, right? Um, how do we actually go about detecting some of this stuff? Because that's, that's, that's the problem that we're at in this industry. Um, you know, you, you, you know, maybe as an attacker, I'm really good at understanding attack, but I'm usually not in a company that's also building defense as well. And so that's the, that's the big gap we have. we have. We have red and we have blue, and then there's this big gap of knowledge in between. The blue, blue people are awesome. They, they defend like no one, no one else's business, but they don't understand the attacker side. And the attacker side can attack like no one else's business, but they usually don't understand the defensive side. And so what ends up happening is you have a team that focuses on something like Carbon Black or Watch List or things like that, and they only know what they know. They don't understand the patterns of behavior, the abnormal patterns of behavior that, that go through and what it, what it takes to actually build a lot of this detection criteria. In. And so we'll talk a little about that. So when you talk about actual layers for a security program, there's three that are my favorites um, that, that when we go into a company, um, you know, stop uh, us or at least trick us up to where we get it uh, detected. And there's a, um, there was a good debate happening, it was probably about a year ago or so, uh, between Jeremiah Grossman and Egypt, I think I've mentioned this before, but Jeremiah was saying, hey, it only takes one vulnerability to get access to a company, right? And it's true, right? You find one vulnerability, you exploit it, you get access, right? And then from there, you move laterally across the network. But what Egypt said was, it only takes one indicator of compromise to detect that that actual attack existed. And that's the whole goal, right? Can you, you know, let's just say we're using some awesome shit on the desktop, and then from there, you know, we start doing some crazy stuff, and you don't detect us in, in your protection or your detection, um, but you hit us in some certain stages along the way around post-exploitation, that's a good way of detecting us. And we'll talk a little bit about deception too. And so, you know, methods of detection become uh, very difficult when it comes to uh, specific types of patterns of, of, of attack and new research coming out every day, not to uh, mention things like the, the unknowns. And so let's take a look at the NSA stuff. What was nice about that one is, you know, you know, this doesn't happen every day, but we're going to use this for the next five years. You know, we're going to be talking about the NSA and WannaCry, even though WannaCry barely impacted us in the United States, but yet we got budget and people were talking about it. Our CEOs came down like, well, are we okay? You know, uh, you know, so we have all this stuff here that we'll leverage for, from a PR perspective from a, from a, for a very long time. Um, but if you look at, at the techniques that Eternal Blue and Double Pulse are leveraged, you know, those are things that we probably would not have detected as it happened, right? You know, all in memory, you know, basically a skeleton key, things like, like uh, uh, Emmet and, and Microsoft's protection mechanisms didn't help us. It was designed to get around that, right? And so, you know, when you look at that specific exploit, and by the way, it's been ported since then to Windows 10, Windows 8, Server 2012 R2, so it in fact affected, uh, impacted every uh, version of Windows. Um, so in that specific case, if we didn't detect on, on Eternal Blue or Double Polestar, which is, you know, highly sophisticated, you know, APT, zero days, the equation group, uh, you know, going in and attacking, if we didn't detect that, could we have detected them in other phases of the attack? And if you look at the techniques that, that the NSA leveraged, what did they do once they compromised the system? You may know? If you looked at the dumps, what did they do? They moved to other systems, didn't they? Until they got access to the SWIFT network that they were going after or other systems that they needed access to. That one entry point was the way into their environment. And you see that, by the way, commonly between Russia, between China, between everybody else that's the, the actors out there, right? They'll compromise somebody in some way, shape, or form through phishing or other techniques, and then from there they move out to the systems they need access to. So if we couldn't have detected Eternal Blue or Double Pulsar, could we have detected other ways of getting access into their environment? And so if you look at that, um, things like, like lateral movement, you know, event log 4624, login type 3, from same source IP address to multiple destinations, that's probably a good indication that there's something amiss on your network that's uh, abnormal in some way, shape, or form. And so what we can do 
is focus on, on, on known good first, so application whitelisting, and then from there start to build out some of our detection criteria, and I'll talk about some of that. The fact that ransomware is a problem is still a problem. Like, how does ransomware infect the machine? How does it affect the machine? Email. Well, email phishing, but what actually happens when they open up a PDF or an Excel document? What's, what's the, the, the code execution piece? It encrypts files, but how does it encrypt files? Like, what, what's the code that actually runs that? Well, how, okay, so, so if I open up an Excel document and it has macros in there, right? And I hit enable on the macros because I'm an awesome user. And I'm not, that's what we're taught. I mean, come on, it's, it's a design feature here. I'm an awesome user, I hit enable. What, what, what happens at that point in time? Usually a, a, the, the macro will go out and probably go and download additional code, right? Like an executable, right? Or PowerShell, right? What does that PowerShell usually do? Goes and downloads an executable? If you look at most malware samples that are out there for ransomware, it's still downloading an executable. Now what's the problem with an executable? It's the same battle we've been fighting since the 90s. Right? The fact that we're still allowing unsigned code, non-code signed, non-code signed executables in our environments, especially in our downloads directories, our temp directories from our users, is the reason why we're in this situation today. You take that away, you take about 90% of the infections that we see today out of the window. Right? PowerShell is morphing into that, and yes, I'd rather us be focusing on detecting PowerShell, but we still don't even have basic EXEs taken care of. So using something like software restriction policies, app locker or device guard or something like that to say, hey, I'm only gonna, I'm gonna block all non-code signing services and maybe put a couple exceptions because we have some shitty developers. You know, other than that, it should be pretty straightforward, right? That's an easy one. That's an easy one to reduce a lot of the noise. So if that fails, let's talk a little about detection. <laughs> That's my favorite. I use that in every one. No matter what presentation I do, I have that baked in somewhere. And so if you look at that, um, you know, we have a number of, of different detection areas. Now, Hopefully you're familiar with Sysmon. Um, Sysmon is a free tool from Microsoft, uh, and, and it installs it as an agent. Now, the, the first thing I love going into a customer with, and being an MSSP company, the you know, first thing we ask them is like, hey, okay, hey, you have a SIM, that's great. And they're like, yeah, we spent you know, $2 million on it, it's fantastic, it's awesome, it does everything. I'm like, cool, cool. I'm like, what kind of logs are you getting from me? He's like, oh, we got our firewall logs, you know, we got this, we got that, we got our domain controllers. I'm like, okay, what about your server logs? We're like, oh, no, no, we're not forwarding those. We got our domain controllers, we're good there. I'm like, okay. Uh, what about your endpoints? No, 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 we're not sending the endpoints too much. Too much. It was too expensive to get all the endpoints going in there. I'm like, okay, okay. So when it comes to detection, you need your servers and you need your endpoints. All right, can we all agree to that? Yes. You need your servers and you need your endpoints, right? So you take those two and that gives you a whole bunch of clarity that you never had before. Sysmon helps with that. Um, there's a number of things that you can detect with Sysmon. Um, you know, image load is a good example. Image load event, uh, event ID 7. Um, and, and so that has uh, DLLs that are being uh, loaded. Uh, it has um, network communications. It has um, you know, service hooks, uh, persistence hooks, you name it. It's an it's a all-in-one tool that you can leverage for your detection. What's nice about this is it's free. Now, uh, we learned this the hard way, um, but if you're using Sysmon 6.0.1, um, it conflicts with, with antivirus and it blue screens, apparently. Um, so you don't want to do it with 6.0.1, but they came out, so what happened was is they had a confliction, uh, antivirus had a confliction with uh, image load, and so it would crash every once in a while, but they fixed that in 6.02 by breaking image load completely. Um, but what's great is they fixed it with 6.03 now, and it doesn't blue screen and image load now works. So we're good now with 6.03, fantastic, it's stable, it works fine, um, I hope. Um, and then you can do a lot of cool stuff with that. Um, a couple of good examples, uh, Mimikast detection, um, uh, Mimikatz is actually really difficult to actually detect on because it's all in memory. Um, that you can detect on the process injection piece, but the way that it actually does it is very, very tricky. Um, it will import vaultclyde.dll. So if you see vaultclyde.dll being imported by, uh, from an image load from anything like command.exe, powershot.exe, or anything outside of your system32 or um, program files directory, it's probably a good indication that Mimikatz is in your environment. Uh, but you can do things like detect process injection, uh, a number of other things out there, which is really easy to go and do uh, through Sysmon. What's fantastic is there's a great resource out there uh, from uh, Swift on Security. Uh, Swift on Security started a, a public config for, for Sysmon um, that you can go and download and it already has the community support. So we're adding things to it all the time on new detection criteria that you can leverage within Sysmon to get the, uh, the logs that you need to, everything from like app bypasses and whitelists and stuff like that. So it's really nice. And they could also do things like with, with Sysmon, um, you can do things like detecting non-PowerShell. Um, so if you see system.automation.na.dll uh, or system.automation.dll being called from non-PowerShell uh, processes. And, and by the way, when we talk about detection on PowerShell, 
There's two directories you have to monitor for. Everybody knows that, right? You have C colon backslash Windows backslash SysWild64 backslash Microsoft PowerShell or Windows PowerShell backslash version 1.0 and C colon backslash Windows backslash System32 backslash PowerShell when, or Windows PowerShell backslash version 1.1.0. Those are two directories to monitor. The SysWild64 is 32-bit 32 compatibility, which most attackers use, like things like PowerShell Empire Unicorn will call SysWild64 for native 32-bit shellcode injection, and then you have your normal uh, 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 System32 directory that has the, the PowerShell stuff in it. So you want to look at both of those. But if you see um, PowerShell being called by those two specific areas, it's probably a good indication that something's amiss. Some other good ones, pass to hash detection. Uh, if you see event ID 4624, login type 3, key length of 0, which means no encryption, low level protocol like SMB or RPC, um, you're going to see um, you know, that, that kind of um, happen. So um, that's a good one. But this is also the same type of detection criteria you can leverage for lateral movement. Why, you know, um, and, and you may have valid reasons for lateral movement in your environment. You want to baseline those and, and you know, whitelist those eventually. But if you see event ID from a local machine from 4624 to login type 3, you know, key length 0, um, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all things that you actually want to take take into account. The truth of the matter is, though, that that um, detection becomes hard work. Now, what happens if your protection fails and your detection fails? What do you have at that point? You breach, right? But it doesn't need to be that way. Those other things. There's another line of defense you can place put into place that I really love, and this is one of my favorites because it actually screwed me up, and I'm one of the ones that helps helped write this one. Um, so. When, when all else fails, you always have deception, okay? And deception is there as your last line of defense of something that you can build in your environment to make things look super baller for an attacker to go after. That's your last line of tripping. And a good example of that is we have uh, something built into our, our, our vision product at, at Binary Defense. We have a, deception, a whole bunch of deception stuff. And when we were coming up with the whole deception modules, um, we have this thing called honey tokens. And we spray them into memory. And so what happens is there's like, you know, like it looks like a domain admin account with a great password. And when a user goes to leverage that, or an attacker goes to leverage that, it creates a, an, an oh shit alarm, right? You know, someone's in your environment, right? No, no lie, I was on a pen test recently, and I had my Windows uh, 10 machine up, which hap I happened to have Vision installed on it, and I happened to see an LLMNR broadcast, a uh, local link, uh, multicast name resolution, slash NetBell's name services uh, happen. And it was named like, you know, like, blah, 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 dash DA. I'm like, oh, that looks like a badass account. So I started cracking it. And I go and I crack, and I go and I use it, and it doesn't work. I'm like, what the... That's, ah, it's vision. I didn't even realize it. And I, I'm the one that put the count up there. <laughs> like I sent it to Charles. I'm like, Charles, this is the count that I, that I think would look awesome in there. And it got me. I, like, I'm like, I feel like a complete idiot when we did it. But there's cool things that you can leverage. And I'll talk about some of those today. But it's one of my favorite techniques by far. Because if you make it look believable enough, and you make enough of them, it's a good chance that someone's going to jack up, and you're going to get them on, on the latter stages of an attack and hopefully stop you. And so building multiple detection techniques about each phase of the attacks um, you know, really uh, creates a whole different level of, of detection for you that you've never seen before, um, and then hopefully you don't have to until it gets to that point. Uh, what was cool is that the, um, the, uh, during the election cycle, during the, the Paris elections, they actually created a whole deception wing uh, for the administration because they got heads up that, that the Russians were uh, going in trying to hack in information to expose it. <laughs> and so they actually put a whole bunch of misinformation out there, fake email accounts, fake infrastructure, fake everything, and it worked. The Russians went after it and then published all this bogus data that made no, no sense whatsoever because they, they went through the fake, uh, fake infrastructure. So it works. And there's so many phases you can apply um, you know, uh, deception to. You can do everything from intelligence gathering, you know, putting misinformation out there as far as what the, uh, uh, um, uh, technology leverage and LinkedIn profiles, fake email addresses to go after. You know, fake infrastructures that have SQL injection, a bunch of other stuff out there. I mean, who knows? You, the, the sky's the limit as far as your deception, how crazy you want to get to it. But I believe that, you know, as an industry, we should have dedicated people just to deception in our environment. Like, it should be a, an actual full-fledged, like, hey, and it sounds cool, like James Bond. She's like, hey, what are you? I'm, I'm, I'm director of deception. You know? <laughs> sounds pretty awesome. It sounds like MI6 or MI5, you know, type, type stuff. And so some of the things you can do, fake email boxes to expose email, uh, CEO's email address, throw uh, segmented devices in the perimeter with SQL eye on it, you know, a lot of cool things you can do. Um, but you can start with the basics first, you know, doing minor things like, like creating, um, you know, with Windows Firewall, you can actually uh, create a lousy in that even though the port's not open, and look for those connection types. So create low, mid, high subset port ranges, and look for those logs, and you can see if someone's port sweeping your, your environment or your network. Um, another thing you could do, just to, to jack me up as an attacker, um, I wrote a tool called Artillery, um, which creates honey, it's a big honeypot, right? What you can do is use uh, unused IP addresses in your environment. Like I'm sure no one's using all of their IPv4 IP addresses, or if you are, you're not using every single port. 
So what you can do is NAT, you know, your unused IP addresses, your unused ports to one box on the internet that has all these ports open. And when someone goes to port scan you across your, your ranges, what does that do? It creates a shitstorm, right? And I have no idea what's going on. I'm like, what was, what the hell's going on? SQL's open over here, SQL's open over here, and that file's open over here. I don't know, I don't know what to do, right? Um, so you create a shitstorm for, for folks on that side. Um, honey docs are great. Um, a, a couple of good things is uh, there's, there's an awesome uh, tool um, by a group that, that wrote this. It's one of my favorites. Uh, it, it just got recently open source, which is fantastic. Uh, the CIA um, had a leak called Vault 7. Um, and so now it's open source, which is great. But it was, there was a program in there called Scribbles. And what Scribbles would do is it would allow you to uh, 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 use watermarks to beacon out. And what you can do is create things like password.xls or domain admin passwords or network passwords, put them everywhere, right? And as soon as somebody opens it, it beacon, that, there's a watermark in there that actually beacons out and sends you a notification um, that someone was opening this document out there. So you can create these documents inside of your environment, hopefully, uh, to get some detection. Now, here's my favorite one, okay? By far, the one where you get the most visibility into right here. Um, so if you, if you take anything out of this from a defensive perspective on the, on the deception side, use this one, um, as well as the next one I'm going to show with Ben's. Um, so this is from Fuzzy Security, um, and this is called Invoke Run As. And so what I would do as a defender is I would, I would make this domain admin account. I'd create a domain admin account that looks just so badass that it's, it's unbelievable, right? Like he's part of every single group, um, you know, enterprise admin, domain admin, you know, uh, you know, put it server administrators, whatever you want. Just put everybody in there. Like it, look, it looks like it's a, a kludge of, of, of permissions. And you can put in the description like, this is an old mainframe account. We need to decommission this. The password is really weak. It's five characters, <laughs> right? Make it look like the sexiest account ever that you can possibly imagine, right? And make that pass through like 700 characters, lock it in a safe, and, and leave it there, right? Because you don't need to use it again. And then what you can do um, with invoke run as is on a login script, it's a PowerShell command. On a login script, what it does is it uses an API. It's a login. Charles, what's the, what's the API? You weren't paying attention, you son of a. So in this, there's a uh, log, uh, login process W, I think, is the API that's leveraged for this one. Um, and what it does is it caches the credentials uh, locally in memory. And why that's important is everybody familiar with the tool called Mimikatz, right? Now, what's interesting in Mimikatz is in Windows 8.1 and, and, and Server, uh, or Windows 10, uh, the, the clear text password stuff in memory has been fixed, right? But what's great with the new version of Mimikatz is it actually extracts the NTLM hash out of memory regardless if it's fixed or not, right? By the way, it's just a registry key. If you do for a 0 to 1 on a registry key, it'll actually start logging the clear text passwords in memory again, which is fantastic. Um, but regardless, put this as a, as a login script for all of your users, every single one of your users. And what happens when they log in, you put that domain admin account in there with the domain, right? And you give it like a five or six character password, right? And so if someone uses Mimikatz in your environment and you're not detecting any of this, and you see that clear text password in memory, they go to use it, what happens? Failed login attempt, right? Should there ever be a failed login attempt on that account? Hell no, right? So you need to take that computer, burn it, you know, take the ashes and bury it, and then burn it again just in case, right? Because that machine's been compromised with something, something nasty on it, right? So that's a great one that, that gets, uh, gets attackers up. And may, by the way, make that password look, look crap. You're like mainframe 2006, you know, whatever you want to make it so that the attacker believes that this is real, right? Um, things I would actively go after. And, and one thing that I would do as an attacker is I will drop into a shell and confirm that that account's actually real, right? <laughs> you know, I actually make sure that that account's active and, and, and leveraged so you can do things to make it more believable. Again, deception is its own industry. There's another good one, uh, LLMR and MBNS broadcasts. Uh, ben, who's going to be speaking next, hopefully he's uh, sit next to his talk. Um, ben wrote uh, um, uh, honey, uh, Invoke Honeycreds, which will send uh, LMNR and MBNS uh, 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 queries across your network. And if you're not familiar with that, local link uh, multi, hang on, local link multicast name resolution and NetBell's name services. I had to get the acronyms right. Um, they, you know, uh, what will happen is when you log into your computer, uh, it'll say, hey, where's file share one? And it could be for mapping drives or getting group policy or whatnot. And as an attacker, you can use a tool called Responder and Vey. Um, and say, okay, yeah, I'm file server one, come on, connect to me, and it connects and passes the net NTM v1 or v2 hashes, depending on group policy, um, to that attacker, and they can crack it offline. So this will send fake credentials across the network, and you can look for failed login attempts, but what you can also do too, which Ben figured out, um, is if you put a fake uh, uh, computer name, fake username, and fake password, should that fake username, fake domain, fake everything else ever be used to log into a remote computer? No, right, because it's fake, right, it's not real. So if you see an event ID, there's an event ID that gets generated. I can't remember which one it is. Hopefully Ben talks about it. 4648. Oh, Ben's over there. 4648, uh, which is explicit credentials are used to log into the remote system. Uh, should that ever, you, should you ever see that event ID with that specific user account? No. So a good indication that LMNR uh, or NV, uh responders on your network. Some good stuff. Uh, using local admin accounts. 
Create a local admin account that's specifically not used by any business process whatsoever across your environment and then uh, employ LAPS with it. Uh, so if you're not familiar with LAPS, it's uh, Microsoft's uh, free tool. It's also one that we wrote. It's open source called Ships. But it randomizes all the local admin passes across the board. Should you ever see any failed login attempts or even any successful login attempts from those two user accounts? No. Absolutely not, right? So good indications right there as well uh, to be able to identify. And yes, you are creating a local administrator, but there's already going to be a local administrator on there. You're not using it in the past was random. So risk probability is, uh, is a very low exposure um, overall. But truth of the matter is, with these three um, areas, the protection, right? We have a decent level of protection, we feel. We have a decent level of detection, but if all else fails, you have that whole deception piece of it. Now, as attackers, you know, we are crafty. We will continuously find new ways around new pieces of technology. Um, as an attacker myself, I don't see a lot of, of, of detection occurring uh, on the types of attacks that we leverage. But again, I feel like the industry itself is getting better, so it's going to be a matter of time. Uh, we have to continuously step up our game. Uh, but with these three uh, techniques, I really have to raise my level, raise my bar uh, to make things work a lot better. With that, without further ado, uh, thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? I can take one or two questions real fast. Heard yeah here? Yeah here? No? Yes? No? You, sir? No? No? Is that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, what's up, man? Can you see it? I walked in just in time before you see ships. <laughs>